Islam. He's the director of the Middle East Forum, a nonprofit organization he founded in 1994, whose slogan is Promoting American Interests. He's a graduate of Harvard University with both a BA and a PhD in history in 1978. He's taught at many universities, including Harvard, Princeton, Chicago, the United States Naval War College, and Pepperdine, and he's regarded as Harvard's 100 most influential living graduates. He's held two presidential positions the United States government, testified before many congressional committees, and worked for five presidential campaigns. He's a prize-winning columnist for the New York Times Syndicate and author of 12 books, which have been published and translated into 29 different languages. He has a unique record of, of anticipating problems, as evidenced by his writings. In 1995, he wrote about radical Islam, stating, stating that, unnoticed by most Westerners, war has been unilaterally declared on Europe and the United States, which of course turned out to be true. And in May of 2000, in response to a question concerning when Syrian troops would leave Lebanon, he said, I would suggest within five years getting the date right within a month. His influence on the public debate has been widely acknowledged. On CBS Sunday morning, he was quoted as being years ahead of the curve in identifying the threat of radical Islam. And Slate Gordon, former U.S. senator and the commissioner who wrote the section of the 9-11 Commission report, saying that the enemy is Islamist terrorism and not terrorism in general, wrote to Daniel Pipe saying that you can credit yourself with some of what we said, even though you do not get credit for it. Thanks for all you have done to chart the right track for America. Tonight is going to speak on vanquishing the Islamist enemy and helping the moderate Muslim ally, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Daniel Pipes. Thank you so much, Soren, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to thank the Leadership Institute and the Collegiate Network who have made this evening's lecture possible. I'd like to thank the entire editorial, editorial board of 631, in particular Kyle Clavender, for all you've done to uh, make it happen. And I'd really like to express my appreciation for the work you are doing to bring a counterweight to the consensus message at the university. Uh, I was a student in the 1960s, at which point the student rebels were on the left, and it's nice to see in the 2000s that student rebels are on the right. And I wish you as much success as your successors had uh, all those decades ago. I think it's heartening and encouraging that you're putting in this kind of work uh, to, to offer the range of ideas that are found nationally, but all too often not found at the university. It's an irony that the university, which is the premier, or should be the premier marketplace of ideas, is in fact so often a place where diversity of skin color and diversity of religion are encouraged, diversity of eye color and gender and so forth, but sexual orientation, but not diversity of thought, it's, of course, diversity of thought that is the key to the learning experience. So thank you and wish you well. My subject is radical Islam and the war on terror. And I'd like to start by noting that we are in election season. And there's a clear distinction between the one party and the other. John McCain said not long ago that we are, quote, facing the tr transcendent challenge of the 21st century. And that is radical Islamic extremism. Rudy Giuliani at the Republican National Convention a few weeks ago taunted the Democrats for not using the term Islamic terrorists. On the other side, Barack Obama has not specifically addressed this issue, which in itself is telling. But other leading Democrats have, notably John Kerry in 2004, when at about this time of year, he said that we have to get back to the place we were, where terrorists are not the focus of our lives, but they're a nuisance. Uh, John Edwards said in 2007, the war on terror is a bumper sticker. William Odom, a, an advisor to some Democratic candidates, and a retired general, said last year, jihadism is a mosquito bite compared to communism. And a couple of months ago, a former deputy national intelligence officer of the CIA, writing an op-ed, said, we must not take fright at the terrorist specter. Our leaders have exaggerated. In fact, we must see jihadists with a small, lethal, disjointed, and miserable opponents that they are. 
So here you have, ladies and gentlemen, a clear choice. McCain talks of a radical Islamic extremism. The Democrats talk of terrorism. McCain talks of a transcendent challenge. The Democrats talk of a mosquito bite. Pretty big difference. So this raises two basic questions. One is who is the enemy? Is it terrorism? Or is it radical Islamic extremism? Two, how dangerous is this enemy? Is it a mosquito bite or is it the transcendent threat we face? After taking on those two questions, I'd like to take on two, two others. What are the methods of this ideology, or this foe? And finally, how should we respond to it? So one, who is the enemy? How dangerous is it? What are its methods? And how should we respond to it? Who is the enemy? This is the absolute vital first topic to understand who we're fighting. It's like a physician who cannot treat a disease before he can identify it. You don't know which medicines to give, do you? Well, a strategist can't win a war unless he knows who the enemy is. You don't know what you're up against. It's absolutely critical. As you heard, there's a big difference. I think one can define the American debate as having three different positions. The first is what I call the establishment position, which is that it's terrorism. Somehow, disjointedly, connected to Islam, a hijacking of Islam, a perversion of Islam, not really Islam, but terrorism. Secretary of State Powell enunciated this view very eloquently that one day after 9-11, when she said that the atrocity should not be seen as something done by Arabs or what he called Islamics, it was done by terrorists. But I know. The problem with this view, which has been long enunciated by the government, by the mainstream media, by the academy, is that it's, excuse me, on the one hand, euphemistic, and on the other hand, inaccurate. Plenty of terrorists, as you're well aware, who are not uh, of this war, say FARC in Colombia, or the Tunnel Tigers in Sri Lanka, major terrorist groups, but unrelated to this. And conversely, were this enemy to get weapons of mass destruction, or to build tanks, planes, and ships, it would no longer be reliant on terrorism. It's a tactic, not an enemy. That's one view, terrorism. The other view, and I'm going to skip to the third view, is that the enemy is Islam. Islam the religion. Islam the faith. And Muslims, as such. This is a view that had no traction, no importance, 10 years ago in the United States, and now is a significant point of view. With websites galore, Books, uh, talk show hosts, even a television host or two, uh, a real presence, some pol political actors. But I think there are three problems with this. First of all, it's ahistorical. It assumes that Islam today, that the problem that we see is the problem of yesterday and tomorrow, that Islam is unchanging. And as I suggested to you before, I got my education in the 60s. Uh, back then, there was no Islamic problem. Islam was religion, jihad, honor killings and so forth were not problems that we were facing. The Muslim world was less religious than it is today. The kind of issues that we're facing today were virtually invisible and non-existent. So things change. If it didn't exist in 1968, there's no reason to, 40 years ago, no reason to assume it'll exist 40 years hence in 2048. It's something that has a history. And what we've seen is a surge of Islamic fervor. It'd be like, like looking at Germany in World War II and concluding that Germany had always been Nazi, will always be Nazi, a thousand year right in the future, and everything was proto Nazi in the past, but it wasn't true. It was Nazi for a specific period of time. It'd be a mistake to understand Germany as unchanging, and always Nazi. Second problem with this is that it turns friends into enemies. There are plenty of Muslims who've been burnt by radical Islam, who don't want any part of it. The worst humanitarian situation in the world today is in Darfur, where a Muslim population is being uh, attacked by its government. Or in Algeria, where an insurgency 15 years ago led to 100, 150,000 deaths. These are Muslims, all Muslims. Not all of them are on the same side. There's a huge difference between the Muslims who support this movement and those who oppose.
oppose it. And to ignore that the ones who oppose it oppose it is, in fact, to turn them into enemies and to lose friends. And I will come back to this later because I think that moderate Muslims have a particularly important role in finding a solution. So first is, it's ahistorical, to say Islam is the enemy. Two, it turns friends into enemies, to say Muslims are the enemy. And three, it leaves the US government with no policy. We're not a crusader state. We're not a state that can fight a religion. We don't know how to do that. If one insists that the enemy is a religion, and all members of the religion are the enemy, what do you do about the three million Muslims who live in this country? And if you say throw them out, what happens if your brother or sister, father, mother, son or daughter converts to Islam? Throw them out too? It's untenable. My solution, my answer, is in between. It's not terrorism and tactic. It's not Islam the religion, but it is a terroristic version of Islam, a certain version of Islam, an extreme version of Islam, a totalitarian, a fundamentalist, a political, call it what you will, but it's a form of Islam. This form of Islam could be reduced to the sentence, Islam is the solution. Whatever your problems might be, Islam offers the answers. Whether you're raising children, whether you are engaged in commercial transactions, whether you're dealing with your family, whether you're cleaning yourself, whether you're taxing, whether you're governing, whether you're going to war, whatever it is, in private and public life, the answer is to be found in Islam. It has four features I'd like to note. The first is the goal of attaining an Islamic order in which caliphate globally applies the Islamic law as understood by the supporters of radical Islam, or Islamists. Islamists seek the global order. A larger version, perhaps, of what one finds in Iran or in Afghanistan under the Taliban. As Tony Blair put it in August 2006, we are fighting a war, but not just against terrorism, but about how the world should govern itself in the early 21st century, about global values. They have a set of values will come back to their very particular version of Islam. Second feature is they've turned faith into a totalitarian ideology. Islam into Islamism. Islamism being like fascism, liberalism, and communism. It's a, it's a, it's a way of understanding power and how it orders the world. To take one example, a hundred years ago in 1908, if you talked about Islamic economics, Muslims would have shrugged. What are you talking about? Yes, there are various precepts in Islam that tell you about the nature of economic transactions, but there's not an economic system. Yet today, there are groaning shelves full of books about Islamic economics. It has grown from Islam to Islamism. Third, there's a clash of civilizations. The Islamist outlook is hostile to Western civilization, wants to replace it, and seeks confrontation. Finally, there's a drive to power domestically and internationally. Take power where Muslims are already a majority and create a Muslim majority and take power everywhere else, including the United States. Radical Islam, then, is a version of Islam that emphasizes its most severe, misanthropic, misogynist, triumphalist, millenarian, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic, anti-Hindu, and jihadi. Now, it's dismaying to see that not just seven years after 9-11, but 30 years after the Iranian Revolution, which began in 1978, the U.S. government still is basically clueless on these subjects. Let me take as an example George W. Bush. He has, over the years, generally shown an increased understanding of this topic. He started with platitudinous, apologetic references to Islam as, quote, the religion of peace, unquote, using this phrase as late as 2006. He early on even lectured Muslims on the true nature of their religion, but his understanding grew, and he began talking in 2003, 4, 5, about the caliphate, Islamic extremism, Islamofascism, 
And what euphemistically had been called the War on Terror in 2001, by 2006 he referred to with a hard-hitting war with Islamic fascists. Things were looking up, perhaps West Washington, the president in particular, did understand the threat after all. But these analyses rouse Muslim opposition, and as he approaches his political twilight, Mr. Bush has retreated to safer ground, reverting recently to decay tropes that tiptoe around the topic of Islam. Instead, he now speaks in elegant, in elegantly of, quote, the great struggle against extremism that is now playing out across the broader Middle East. So, extremism that is now playing out across the broader Middle East. And he speaks vaguely of, quote, a group of extremists who seek to use religion as a path to power and a means of domination. That's the current state of play. So what one sees is a government, and Mr. Bush is representative of the larger government, that is indecisive, inaccurate, and has not come closer to finding what the nature of the enemy is. And so long as it's not found the nature of the enemy, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot win the war. Second question, how dangerous is this phenomenon? I would argue to you that it's comparable to fascism and communism. It is similar in that they have compelling, radical utopian visions. All three of them have a vision of the society that is just. And this vision attracts, in all three cases, talented individuals. None of them depend on the dregs of society. All of them have the benefit of some of the smartest people in their civilizations. All three attempt to take over states, and once they've taken over states, they use state power to coerce the subjects of that state and then aggress against neighbors in an effort, finally, to spread their vision around the world. They have a cosmic vision, and they see the West in particular, all three, and the United States, most specifically, as the obstacle to attaining that worldwide hegemony. Now, they're not all so different uh, in that... Radical Islam doesn't have a great power base like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. But they're also stronger, the Islamists, in that they have a religious appeal. Fascism and communism are anti-religious. By having a religious appeal, Islamism can have a deeper resonance and a greater staying power. I would estimate that some 10-15% of the Muslim population worldwide supports this vision of the caliphate applying the Islamic law. Do the numbers, and with over a billion Muslims, that gets you something in the order of 125 to 200 million committed cadres for this movement. That is far more than all the fascists and communists who've ever lived. But they have a base, it's huge. They have, and this popularity, it's not just limited because the good works and devotion of the Islamists gives them a reputation. And they attract votes and support money from those who don't even agree with their vision. And so they have a machinery for electoral success. They win elections, most notably in Turkey, but also in Iraq. And they do well in um, Afghanistan, and Lebanon, and Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. They won in the Palestinian Authority. They're doing well. They don't need to use coal and win through the electoral process. And most dramatically, one finds, and most different from fascism and communism, one finds that there's an evolution in radical Islam that suggests it can work. And one sees this especially in Turkey, but to a lesser extent in Bangladesh, that Islamism is a workable ideology. In Turkey, the Islamist government that took over in 2002 has had an economic boom. Uh, it's taking care of long festering issues such as the Cyprus, the Kurds, and the European Union accession. Success. So I would conclude that this phenomenon is not just a mosquito bite, but a worthy enemy. Point three, what are its methods? Well, there are two. The one you're more familiar with is the violent one. Terrorism and other forms of coercion. But I note 
that in the past decade there has been a significant move away from violence in favor of working within the system. What some call soft jihad or stealth jihad, what I call lawful Islamism. Now these two, move, these two wings of the same movement share the same goal of application of Islamic law worldwide. But they differ in their methods. So on the one hand you have Osama bin Laden, and on the other hand you have the Prime Minister and the President of Turkey. The former is hiding in a cave, and the latter are ruling a country of 75 million people and doing a good job. I don't think the former is clearly more successful than the latter. Now each of these methods has its advantages. Violence destroys and intimidates. Lawful Islamism insinuates and subverts. But looked at from the long term, I think the latter lawful method is more likely to achieve success as it has in Turkey, Bangladesh, Palestinian Authority, and elsewhere. I think we don't have muscle. We don't quite understand. Not, not just the Turks, but we here. We don't understand this problem. It's something new. We have religious-based ideology that considers what it has to offer superior to our way of life. In brief, seeks to replace the Constitution with the Quran. We don't know how to deal with that. We do know how to deal with violence. Now, I'm not saying that there won't be any more uh, successful acts of violence, perhaps on a very large scale. But I am saying that I don't see what it's going to take. I mean, you look back on 9-11, and it's hard to argue from the Islamist point of view, this was a, a, a successful enterprise. What did it get for them? Or 7-7 in London. Madrid admittedly did change the government, or led to a change of government. But Bali, Beslan, it's hard to see in these major terrorist, major terrorist attacks what they gained by it. They can't. There's no instance so far of terrorists taking over a government. The Islamist governments that have come to power have either been through the election box or in Iran through civil through revolution, Afghanistan civil war, or Sudan through coup d'etat. No case has terrorism worked. Uh, terrorism did, for example, kill the president of Egypt in 1981 on our side, but it just led to his vice president taking over. It didn't have a profound impact. So, Islamists are noting this, and in countries like Algeria, Egypt, and Syria, they are giving up their violent ways and going straight, going on television, working within the school system. And I think that is no less dangerous. Granted, it's a success not to have murderous rampages, but on the other hand, it's more worrisome when the enemy burrows quietly in the night and we can all sleep. The war on terror cannot be limited to violent enemies, but must also identify and weaken political enemies. War on terror is not exactly a good way of describing it. It's something more profound. It's a war in radical Islam. And finally, about our war goals. We, base, we have two basic choices as we did, for example, in the Cold War. Do we co-opt or do we confront? And basically, those on the left say co-opt and those on the right say confront, then and now. Co-option would be a nice way to go, if it works. Co-option assumes that there are steps we can take to reduce the threat of radical Islam. That, for example, changing American foreign policy, or providing more foreign aid, or announcing Western neo-imperialism, uh, would, in fact, end this challenge of radical Islam. But I don't see it. I don't see that American foreign policy, or poverty, or other such specific elements are the key to radical Islam. In other words, if we changed our policy tomorrow, if 
we withdrew from Iraq <coughs> overnight, if we renounced our relationship with Israel overnight, is it possible to think that this vast, worldwide, 125 to 200 million people would just simply say, oh, our problems are solved? If we provided foreign aid in massive amounts and say it worked, which not likely it worked, but let's say it did, uh, and we are providing, for example, massive amounts of, of foreign aid to the Palestinians. Uh, would we see a change? No. They would use this money to get arms and make themselves stronger. No indication whatsoever that they would change consciousness and become liberal as a result. I think the real cause of radical Islam has to do with a sense of failure in the modern world sense that a thousand years ago the civilization of Islam was a top. Muslims were the strongest and the most cultured peoples. Cities like Cairo and Baghdad were at the top of the game. Now they're impoverished. Civil war. What inventions are coming out of there? What uh, great corporations are there? What great universities are there? They're behind. The sense that the Muslim world has been left behind. And the way to bring the Muslim world up to power and ahead is by turning to radical Islam. It's by turning to one's roots to apply the laws as they were applied a thousand years ago. This is a deep sense of frustration that's being enacted. Deep sense of envy and rage. There's no way that our shift in policy or turning over some money would address these issues. And therefore, I conclude that co-option is not a viable policy option. And therefore, I conclude that we must fight, confront, and fight, and defeat this movement, as we did in 1945 with fascism, as we did in 1991 with communism. We defeated them. We marginalized them. They're still around, to be sure. But these are small, nearly irrelevant movements our goal must be, with radical Islam, to marginalize it, weaken it, so that it too, one day, still exists, but is minor. No longer the world-shaking ideology that it is today. Now, towards this end, we find the government, again, has a very vague notion. I have tried for years to find an enunciation of American policy in this war. Here's about the best I could find from Donald, Donald Rumsfeld in 2001. He said that our goal is to create an environment in which the freedom-loving American people could fulfill and live their lives while their enemies would be prevented from adversely affecting this way of life. What do you do with that? It's not an objective you can hand to a general and say, here, achieve this. It's still vague. As recently as this January, the Department of Homeland Security issued guidelines that suggest renaming the war on terror, quote, get this, a global struggle for security and progress, unquote. What are you going to do? How do you fight a global struggle for security and progress? What does this have to do with anything? I believe that our goal must be to induce Islamists to give up on their ideology. And that implicitly means getting them to modernize their understanding of their religion. Our goal has to be to help create an Islam that is modern, moderate, democratic, humane, liberal, and good neighborly. One that is respectful of women, of homosexuals, atheists, one that grants non-Muslims equal rights with Muslims. Now, I know some of you are thinking, moderate Muslims, where are they, who are they? Is it like the unicorn, much discussed and never seen? No, there are moderate Muslims. They really do exist. Perhaps the most potent showpiece of modern Islam was last summer, a year and a bit ago, when some three, four million people turned out in the streets of Izmir, in Turkey, to protest the ruling coalition, the ruling party. Secular, saying 
No army, no Islamic law. They do exist. They exist in this country. Uh, there are, I can give you names of specific modern Muslims who are at risk to themselves, their careers, their reputations, standing up against radical Islam. And they are weak in this country and globally. But they do exist, and they can one day turn into a movement. They're not a movement today. And however weak they are, and however skeptical you may be of their, of, of their future potential, I suggest to you there is no alternative, that ultimately it must be Muslims who offer an alternate understanding of Islam. Well, we who are not Muslims, who can do it as Muslims? If radical Islam is the problem, offered Islam, is the solution. I agree. It's a long way off. But there's no alternative. I def defy you to give me an alternative. You can have a fantasy alternative. Convert all the Muslims to another religion. Uh, quarantine all the Muslims. Massacre all the Muslims. But these are not going to happen. These are not going to happen or don't we want them to happen. In the latter case, can't happen. So realistically, in terms of policy, looking to establish an alternate, acceptable version of Islam is the, is the goal. Now, the two steps to this. One is defeating the Islamists, and that's our burden. Again, like World War II defeated the fascists, the Cold War defeated the communists. Victory is our goal, to marginalize them. We have, in 1945 and 1991, bookends. 1945 was blood and steel, total victory, total war, absolute victory. And 1991 was this very strange um, conflation, <coughs> implosion of the Soviet Union, almost without a shot fired, a result of economic, psychological, and political factors. But there they go, one total violence, the other was without violence, somewhere in between. These two bookends will be the war on radical Islam. The great debate in this war, well, the, the great issue in this war, is not who will win on the battlefield. Because we, who are against the Islamists, predominate in terms of arsenal, manpower, economy, control of territory, population, you name it. We have all the strength. The question is whether we have the will to fight. And that is an open question. Islamists are weak in every way except will. We have the hardware, they have the software. I don't know. I'm optimistic that we will rally, but we are very divided. And again, it's basically on, along left right lines, where the right is worried and the left is not. And the result is we're not terribly effective. The second step, so the first step, is defeating the Islamists. And the second step is strengthening the moderate Muslims. We can only go so far, we who are not Muslims. Muslims are the key to the problem and to its resolution. Moderates need to reinterpret the Quran, reinterpret <coughs> terms like jihad, the status of women, reinterpret the role of the Sharia. Slavery is still, in some places, considered a legitimate institution. You're not a true Muslim unless you believe in slavery. The goal must be, our goal must be, the emergence of Islam that is different, that is reformed, that has changed. Our goal must be to help these moderates by celebrating, funding them, getting their ideas out, by delegitimating the Islamists, exposing their activities and their In conclusion, there's not a clash of civilizations taking place between the West and the Muslim world. There is a great intra-Muslim clash. What does it mean to be a Muslim? And we in the West are auxiliaries of those Muslims who think like we do, who don't want this application of Islamic law. And the great question for us, we have a battle too. The battle is, do we take this seriously? Do we see it as a mosquito bite or a transcendent challenge? Do we understand it as terrorism or do we understand it as a 
great, vast, threatening ideological movement.